Hello everyone, um, it's wonderful to have you with us here this evening. Um, as you know, our theme this month is Women in STEM. Um, and throughout the month, we will be releasing a variety of content centered around women that are studying and working in the field of STEM. So that's science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, to kick things off with our first live session, we are joined by the fantastic Dr. Yolanda Ohini, who is a researcher at the University of Manchester. So Yolanda has used MRI technology to develop novel techniques for studying neurodegenerative diseases with a groundbreaking technique which combines physics and biology. So before I hand over to Yolanda, regular followers of our platform will notice that I am not Aisha, who usually hosts our live sessions. Uh, sadly, Aisha is unavailable this month. So I have stepped in and I hope to do justice to the wonderful speakers that we have lined up for you. So my name is Jess. Um, I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Manchester. And as a neuroscientist, I cannot wait to hear this fascinating talk. For those who are new to our platform, I will quickly fill you in of, for the structure of this session. So for the next 25 to 30 minutes, Yolanda will be talking us through her research, after which we will take a 10 minute break and resume for a live Q&A session. So this is where I ask questions on behalf of you, our lovely audience members. So during the talk, please do submit any follow-up questions you have for Yolanda by YouTube or any of our social media channels, and I am sure she will be happy to answer them for you. So Yolanda, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. I will let you now take the stage um, and talk to us about your fascinating research. Thank you, Jess. Thanks so much for the warm welcome. Um, I'll just share my screen. And okay, I'm gonna begin here. So what I'd like to talk to you today is what water parks have got to do with Alzheimer's disease. So I'll be exploring this during the talk. Um, and as Jess introduced, um, to you all, and uh, my name is Dr. Yolanda Heaney, and I'm a neuroimaging scientist. So I use and develop imaging techniques, specifically MRI techniques, to look at the brain. And my trajectory has been: I started as a uh, undergraduate physics student, and then um, after that, I moved on and did a little bit of work um, with in science communication, working for a few production companies before starting a PhD in um, medical imaging. So I did my PhD in UCL um, and my PhD was centered around developing MRI techniques um, to look at the brain and specifically for um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and now I've just recently in the last six months or so moved to the University of Manchester. So I've come up north and it's treating me well so far. Um, and I'm continuing the work and developing uh, another um, MRI technique to also with a focus on, on Alzheimer's disease. Um, so first of all, I think I've always been really interested in imaging um, because I think it's fascinating when you're able to um, use techniques and physics techniques to, to be able to see things that we can't really see with our eyes, such as airport scanners, um, X-rays, um, infrared temperature probes which we're getting so used to these days um, and I think what was even more fascinating to me was when I found out that you were able to use techniques to look inside the body and specifically inside the brain to help us to understand um, health and disease. Now I'm going to show a picture of a brain here and I think it's such a fascinating organ because it uses so much of the, the energy that we consume with so, such little weight. And also, I suppose it's really the, the dynamic component of the body and, and there's so, still so much that we don't understand about the brain. And I think one thing that's really um, revolutionized healthcare um, amongst other techniques is this MRI technique, so magnetic resonance imaging. And this has been around for quite a while, around um, the 1970s that um, it was first developed um, by um, this scientist, uh, Peter Mansfield, 
um, along with um, some other scientists as well across the uh, across the world. But I, I put his picture because he's a UK British scientist, so we've got to celebrate them. Um, and I think that it's amazing that they were able to kind of build this technique upon the electromagnetism and electromagnetic principles which had been uh, developed maybe a hundred years before in the 1800s and um, with the foundation of, of, of Maxwell's principles. And I think it's really um, revolutionized healthcare because we're able to see um, inside the, the brain, which is kind of this really soft tissue that, um, this is unlike kind of the bones that we see using x-rays um, and it does that using magnets. So um, I've got my own picture next to an MRI scanner here um, and that's me in UCL. And so magnetic resonance imaging, it uses uh, really strong magnets and magnetic fields and magnetic gradients. And then it also uses a radio frequency pulse um, to be able to um, to be able to give a little bit of energy um, to the water molecules inside, inside the body. And so it gives off this little bit of energy and excites the water molecules a little bit. And then when, it, when the radio frequency pulse is turned off, the water molecules that have got this extra energy is able to give us a little bit of energy back. And so using a signal transmitter, and a signal receiver were able to then um, capture uh, this signal from different aspects of the body and, and my work in the aspects of the brain. Um, and what's really clever is that we're, we will capture an image that might look something a little bit like this, and we place some maths um, called a Fourier transform, which maybe if you've done um, maths or physics, you may have come across um, this mathematical technique. And what's amazing is that this, um, this signal is then able to be transferred into this uh, MRI image that we know of the brain. So here is an MRI image of um, different segments across the brain. And it's really um, targeted or focused on the water molecules um, within the brain. And so those different shades of grey that you're seeing um, across these different slices will tell you something about the environment that the water is in within the brain. So you can see, you may be familiar with kind of, you may have heard of grey matter and white matter before within the brain and you can see these contours of the grey, the grey matter and surrounding that are these really bright spots which is actually something called the cerebral spinal fluid. So this is a fluid that surrounds the brain. And that's much brighter because um, it's liquid and it's able to move a little bit more than the grey matter and white matter, which are um, a lot darker in this image. So this is a structural um, image of the brain. But if we, and it shows where kind of the, the water molecules are, which may give us our first clue as to what water parts have got to do with Alzheimer's disease. Um, but really, if we want to study the brain, um, we have to think about, or we want to study the brain further, we have to think about how the water molecules are behaving dynamically. Because if we just sit here and just reflect for a second, our brain is responding to our heart beating, us respiring. It's, it's moving all the time. It never, never switches off, which is, which is quite amazing. So to be able to cap capture some of these dynamic processes which occur in the brain. Is, is, is very useful and helpful for us to better understand how the brain works. And so this brings me on to Alzheimer's disease. And um, the problem with Alzheimer's disease is that we're really um, able, we're capturing it a bit too late. The changes that occur in the brain may um, start even 20 years before people um, come to the doctors to say that they suffer back from memory loss, from confusion and all the usual symptoms for Alzheimer's. And I think it's really devastating because it, it, it was the, the, the biggest global healthcare uh, challenge of our time. I think it's just been overtaken by COVID at the moment, but I think it's really devastating that um, just in 20 years, so many more people are going to uh, end up suffering from, from dementia. 
Um, and one of the reasons is that we're kind of living in an aging population. And so the biggest risk factor currently for, um, for actually getting dementia would be, um, would be aging. Now, just a little bit of background for, um, for Alzheimer's disease. And I found this, uh, this fun cartoon here, but what I want to highlight are the two molecules, which are called amyloid, um, which is a, um, an extracellular mo molecule, and another um, molecule called tau, which forms these neurofibrillary tangles, which are found within the neurons. And so it's the, the dysfunction or the changing of these two molecules in the brain, which um, is a real hallmark of, of Alzheimer's disease. Now, there's, it's kind of, there's different hypotheses at the moment around what actually will start the disease. And um, a hypothesis that I've been following and that my work is kind of focused around is the, the dysfunction or the changes or breakdown to the blood-brain barrier. So this is a, 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 a membrane or a barrier that protects the brain uh, from all of the unwanted molecules and toxins that the brain doesn't need. Um, and the hypothesis goes that um, if you have dysfunction to your blood-brain barrier, then this would then cause an influx of pathogens and neurotoxins into the brain, so things that the brain doesn't want, and that would cause an immune response of the brain, which will um, invoke this amyloid, this one, this one molecule um, that you saw in the in the cartoon um, that's been deposited in the brain um, unnaturally within um, Alzheimer's disease, which will then go on um, to cause um, neurodegeneration. Now, this is where my um, analogy comes in. So, well, first of all, my, the aim of this, the, 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 the studies that I've been doing on the, the aim of my research is to develop new and non-invasive and sensitive MRI techniques um, to measure this dysfunction of the blood-brain barrier. And um, I like to think about it um, in terms of this analogy with the water park. So um, if we just cast our minds to a water park and think that like um, water parks are made of flumes and pools and uh, other flumes, and we imagine that the, the water is moving between the flumes and into the pools and into the other flumes. Now, if we imagine that the flume is like the blood vessel and the pools are a little bit like the brain tissue. Now, imagine that um, the flume becomes damaged. And so that will mean that if you're sliding along the flume um, and you're kind of like the, the people, the people having fun are like the molecules within the brain, if, it, 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 within this analogy. So if the, um, the, the flume becomes damaged, then um, the people would go everywhere, wouldn't they? Like you, they would be all over the place um, and in the places that they're not meant to be. Um, and also they might build up within the, within the pools if, if, if there's damage to the, 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 the flume. And then imagine if also the water molecules start to slow down within the flumes. And you as a, as a person, as the molecules that the brain needs, um, would also slow down within the blood vessels and you might become stuck in the flumes. So this is kind of, um, there's two, two angles to the research in that if the changes to the water movement is too fast, it may mean that the, the, the molecules are everywhere that they shouldn't. And if the uh, the water movement is too slow, then that might mean that the molecules are getting stuck and building up in the blood vessels. Um, and so this is kind of, this is what my research is focused around, developing techniques that are able to measure this, this water movement in the, in, the, in the brain. And it's quite cool because you probably don't consider that the, the water specifically is moving in the brain. Um, and, but it's quite in, in, important to maintain a, a, a healthy brain. And so one way to be able to, um, one way that, or one technique that I've been developing in my PhD is an MRI technique called arterial spin labeling. And so what this means is that you use a radio frequency pulse to actually, to label the water, which is moving through um, the blood vessels in the brain and across into the brain tissue. 
And so what you do is you label them, then you wait a given time, and then you capture your image to see how many of these water molecules have moved across the blood-brain barrier and into the, into the brain tissue. So it's quite a dynamic process that we can um, that we we can use we can make the MRI um, um, capture how the water is moving here, and actually what we found or what I found in my PhD was that there's this important molecule it's it's called um, aquaporin four and it's actually a water channel that sits on the blood brain barrier. And that really helps with how the brain um, allows water into the brain and also clears um, the water from the brain, taking along with it these um, uh, molecules that are perhaps unwanted and that perhaps may build up in the, in the brain. So I found so I looked to see that they I found that they were very important for the water transfer um, in the brain tissue. What I also found out is that in aging, in the aging brain, you see this uh, speeding up of the water molecules. Um, and so these molecules, so this might mean that these toxic molecules, such as amyloid, uh, may be found in places that it shouldn't be. And then now, while I'm in the University of Manchester, um, I'm currently developing another technique which um, you perhaps can see the different color uh, water molecules on the, on the screen here. And what this technique does is it actually captures the diffusion properties of the water. And so when it's in, when the um, water molecules are in the blood vessels, it moves at a different rate from when the water molecules are in the brain tissue. So what, what I'm trying to do at the moment is to target specifically the water molecules in the, in the blood vessels and see how they're crossing the blood brain barrier using these diffusion properties and it's amazing that we're able to target these water molecules without having to um, inject something like a radioactive tracer which are used for other um, imaging techniques or we don't e we don't have to even um, inject a magnetic tracer which is often used to see the breakdown of the blood brain barrier so we remove all of that from um, if we're able to if we're able to do this successfully. So there's a, there's a big question here, is that actually, if we're able to show that the blood-brain barrier breaks down um, early in, the, in Alzheimer's disease, then what? There's still not a cure for Alzheimer's. So, so far, I think over 200 drugs have already failed for um, for um, in, in trials of, of testing for Alzheimer's. And there's recently actually a drug has been approved um, in the last month or so, but it's, it's a little bit controversial for that, um, that approval. But really, I think that these techniques such as using um, MRI are really um, helpful because if we know the different aspects to target within the, the brain, such as, um, if we can get the, the the water to slow down or speed up, which might help with um, this uh, the cognition of the patients, then we might be able to uh, create drugs which target perhaps these water channels, and um, which would help maybe sl slow down or even stop the disease, and that would be really great. Now, um, just to finish my talk, I just thought I would um, bring in a bit of the, um, the other side of, of science, not the scientific work that I do, but more um, the community building outreach and kind of equality diversity um, work that I've been doing over the years. And um, I just wanted to pose the question of like, what are the challenges in diversifying um, perspectives surrounding science and surrounding physics and I think that they're on very like many levels from um, a lack of representation um, a lack of confidence in groups who are minoritized within um, science and and physics is quite extreme because uh, obviously there's, n there's not so many uh, women who do physics and also not many people from maybe um, of black heritage who, who do physics as well. And um, noticing this like through the years that I've been um, in academia, 
um, a few years ago, I, and through many chats with some of my friends who were also doing PhDs, we thought, why don't we see, uh, we, why don't we see diverse faces in the media, in science talks and festivals, that kind of thing? There must be more people out there than actually is represented. So what we did was we saw, oh, we'll kind of, we'll start a network, the Minorities in STEM network, just to, um, just to link people up, really, to connect people, to showcase what the work that, that, that people from ethnic minority backgrounds are doing. So um, do follow us, um, maybe also um, tweet and, and you can curate a week um, on the Minority in STEM account if you're from an a, a, a ethnic minority background and work in, in STEM. Um, and we found that actually one of the amazing things was that there's so many different stories that we don't really hear of. And it was, it's been really a nice journey to connect the dots and not always feel like a bit of an outsider. So that's been wonderful. And we have a Slack channel to be able to, that, that with the different channels to support um, each other, to share, to share opportunities, to give each other a leg up uh, when needed. And then also, um, I studied physics at Imperial College London, and um, last year, just over a year ago, we we decided to create a network for UK black physicists, and this was kind of, I mean, obviously, so much has happened in terms of um, Black Lives Matter, and really, lots of people that beginning to or not beginning to, but continuing to highlight in so many different areas how underrepresented black um, black people are in the workplace. And specifically in physics, there's only 1.65% of physics students identify as black, which is tiny. Um, and then even less so when moving to, um, to postgraduate studies. So we thought we'll start um, a, a collective of black physicists to kind of in a similar vein as um, the Minorities in STEM network to connect people, to support people, um, to give each other a, a, a leg up um, where needed. Um, and I, I think that this is needed um, because of so many, um, so many, uh, for so many reasons, because um, from very much senior staff right down to people who are at school studying um, thinking about studying science. I think it's very important that um, a wider range of people are represented and also um, that people who have the passion to study science um, and have that like can should have the confidence to be able to go uh, into a scientific career. So that's all from me and I just had a little slide to say who can work in science everyone. So thanks a lot um, for, um, for listening and I'm really excited if you've got any questions um, that I'll, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Yolanda, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, that was so incredibly interesting, not just from a science perspective, but obviously from um, widening our kind of view of who can be a scientist and what that should look like and that was so such a privilege to listen to so thank you um and i know our audience members will have loved that as well so um we're going to take a quick 10 minute break now um i will gather all of the questions that have been submitted and then we will be returning at approximately five past seven um to go through your questions for yolanda so See you in a little minute. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you so much for submitting your questions. There have been so much uh, positive feedback for how Yolanda has explained this subject um, and made it both accessible and interesting, which I definitely agree with. So let's delve into some questions, if that's okay, Yolanda. First up, uh, we have a question. So if we know that aquaporin-4 expression increases as we age, do we understand why this happens? If so, 
is there a way that we can prevent this expression from occurring in the first place? Mm, yeah, that's a that's a, <laughs> a good question because yeah, we do know that aging will mean that aquaporin four expression will be increased, and I suppose that the I suppose the the thing regarding the function of the aquaporin four is whether they're functioning correctly. So even if the the aquaporin four um, there's more of them, if they're not in the correct place and if they're not doing their job correctly, then we, we also have to kind of understand why or how how that occurs. Um, so overall, I, I, I think there's, there's quite a few questions in terms of um, um, where active point four will be and what its role is and what its role with regards to Alzheimer's disease is over, over time. I think it looks like yeah. um, I'll tell you what, I'll jump in and um, ask another question and we'll see if Jess returns. Great, thanks Alex. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Um, so this is an interesting one. So we've had a question, uh, what are the properties of water molecules that allow you to tag them without using a tracing agent? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, and so a water molecule, basically in MRI, you will tune the radio frequency pulse um, to like the chemical composition of um, your, your, the molecule that you want to target. So it's usually targeting water molecules. Um, so the structural images that we see are usually water. You are able to tag other, other molecules. That's possible if you, if you change this kind of the, the, the frequency. So in the technique that arterial spin labeling that were, that were, that were, that I was using in my PhD, it's actually targeting a uh, moving water molecules. So the, the, so you target them in, you can do it a few ways. And, but the problem, probably one way to, that's easy to describe is you, you, give a little bit of radio frequency pulse to the supplying um, um, arteries go into the brain. And so, and then you wait a given time. And so basically what you'll do is you'll take a before and after shot. So you'll see what, where the, just the static water is before, then you'll label your moving water, wait a given time and see what your um, dynamic shot looks like. And the difference between those will give you um, how much water molecule has moved into your imaging slice at a given time. So that's, um, that's one way to do it, um, using this arterial spin labeling. Um, or targeting the, because we know that the water's moving um, the whole time, like, um, and it moves at a different rate depending on if it's in a cell, whether it's outside of a cell, if it's in a water molecule, if it's in a blood vessel, sorry. So that's another way in which we're able to target how it's how it's moving from these dynamic properties of the of the molecules. That sounds bloody complicated. <laughs> it does. Um, can everyone see me now? I'm sorry that that yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I was let down by by Wi-Fi, but. Um, so I'm assuming that you have not asked this question yet, so I'm going to go in and ask. Um, in your view, Yolanda, uh, what is the biggest barrier to inclusion and representation in STEM? Um, I mean, there's many. Tricky question. Tricky question. <laughs> yeah. Um, one, I think, that is maybe skirted around a little bit um, is um, science being really elite and that like only if you're a genius, like can you do it? And so I think that there's studies to show that particularly say women or girls in sixth form don't have as much confidence as boys at that age and they don't think that they'll be able to do it. And that's kind of a barrier early on and I think that that stays through 
or not necessarily stays through but I think that that's one thing where it's like oh only only if you're a genius can you do science and therefore it's like well oh well it's impossible I'm not going to be able to try so I think that that's a huge psychological barrier um and um I think that in like in terms of um just the the nature of inclusion if it's just um one group of people then often say for physics it's often white men who are doing it then just by the nature of that group that it's it's harder to feel included if there's if the thought like if people are just white men from private schools are doing physics for example then it's quite difficult if you're not from that group to um to know to eat just 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 to feel like you know what other people are talking about um so I mean there's many other things but those are the things that like I've been thinking about maybe recently about this kind of intellectual elitism and um, maybe the lack of um, representation as well like it's it's I just I think so sorry because it, it, it's there's so much behind it and I actually didn't speak so much so long about it because it's quite um, it's sometimes it can be a bit emotional and um exhausting as well but I think that say an undergraduate not one of my favorite lecturers um, was uh, Professor Michelle O'Doherty who's a woman and I just think that just by nature of her being a woman and as well as, as a fantastic scientist a fantastic physicist just you just saw a bit more of yourself in them so knowing that you could perhaps make it to the next level because there's someone else who's done that before but if you see no one then I think that's also a thing of like oh well this isn't for me if you don't see anyone like you in those uh, higher positions absolutely absolutely I think it's so difficult to kind of become something you can't see yourself you know yeah um and I think definitely in my experience I think the higher up you go especially in science and academia, the higher up you go, the less people you're likely to see that are, you know, minorities, that are female, that are, you know, diverse. I think that can be very off-putting, um, but hopefully I think, you know, it's a kind of, as we increase the representation higher up, hopefully that will have a knock-on effect in, you know, helping people at the, the very start of their, their studies or their career like realize that you don't have to fit a certain image of you know what it is to be a scientist um I think that's yeah that's really important but I think to follow up from that we have a, a kind of a related question which I'll I'll pose to you so someone's asked do you have any suggestions as to how white people can create a more welcoming and positive atmosphere for BAME individuals in STEM yeah, this question comes up quite a bit. And I think that it's um, a matter of doing, everyone do putting in the work, you know, that it's not, it's like thinking about how, like what are the things that you think might make someone else um, from different minoritized groups not feel welcome? Like, I suppose, the thing that comes to my head is kind of laddish culture is not for everyone is it and so if you're in a very laddy um environment then that's not for everyone and they're not gonna like everyone's not gonna like that so making sure that that you behave appropriately I think and I think following from that is calling out microaggressions I think is a super helpful thing that people can do in terms of if there's a victim like if someone's being bullied or is it microaggression, just a small thing, don't don't sit there and let that person have to defend themselves because that's really hard. You've already you're already a victim. So just calling calling out other people's behaviour when you um, when you see it. Like I mean, like we've seen with the football this 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 week that it's like we all have to stand against it, don't we? In racism of course we have you have to do something you have to be proactive so yeah that would be one of my 
uh, tips like calling out um, microaggressions and also not being scared of getting it wrong like no one knows all 100% of the answers about how to behave around everyone everyone's an individual and so it's just about creating like good communication so that people everyone feels that they they can say that they don't feel comfortable and that people will respond accordingly or that if someone says something that it they're not sure about that it's not an attack but it's just a conversation like let's move through it together um would be sort of like another thing that um um another point that I would say about sort of like allyship yeah absolutely I think on on both sides feeling feeling free to be able to call out when things are not um not suitable and not creating a good atmosphere and also you know feeling able to admit when you have you realize that you've made a mistake I think that's that's really important on both sides um as you said we're all we're all learning and we're all you know opening this conversation so yeah yeah, definitely um a few more questions about um about your incredibly fascinating research if that's okay um, so someone's asked, where and how do you inject the RF signal into the blood supply and how fast does it decay? Oh, yeah, that's good. Um, because the RF pulse will come from like um, like a. Um, um, it's not something that you would inject. Um, you'll have um, a, 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 a signal transmitter, so it will transmit some of the radio frequency pulse. Um, into the the region that you're interested in so depending on your setup um it 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 it, it will cover a different range um the decay of it um well the pulse is very fast so you will have a very fast pulse and then the, the water will get excited and decay at a particular rate depending on where it is in the body so like for example when I mentioned the CSF the cerebral spinal fluid in that particular image that was decaying a lot uh, faster than the um, the signal from the gray matter and the white matter and so because it decayed faster it gives off more signal and then there'll be a brighter part of the image so yeah that the, there's a lot of time scales that the MRI kind of works on here Thank you. That that has certainly made it um, much more clear for me because it's such a such a complex um, such a complex technique. Um, we have one last question that I can see if that's okay. Um, so, what are the benefits of not using the tracers, such as the magnetic ones, during the diffusion process? Yeah, so there's a few um, there's a few aspects of why it's good to eliminate a tracer. First of all, I suppose in terms of they're, they're, they're safe, they're used in the clinic all of the time. Um, they might not be safe. Um, oh, no, they are safe. Some people might react quite badly to it in terms of um, sometimes it goes through the kidneys and people have a reaction to this magnetic tracer. So that's a very small part of um, a small subsection of people that might happen to so um, obviously eliminating having to inject something is good because you probably don't want extra things in your body that um, are unnecessary um, and also it's it would be more efficient in terms of like in terms of clinical use if you don't have to have someone there that's, that injects as well um, there is a bit of um, evidence to show that maybe the traces do build up in the brain over time if you have to have a lot of the um a, a lot of scans but that's also um not 100 percent like uh, uh well it, it there's there's research to show that how widespread that is is you know still up for debate but one of the big uh, benefits of using water as a tracer as opposed to um, a magnetic tracer is that a water molecule is really really small so it's like about i think it's about 100 times smaller than um, the magnetic 
um, molecule that you inject. And so that means that hopefully this is more sensitive to small changes, uh, say in the blood brain barrier, compared to like, if you have a, a gross change in the, in the or a huge breakdown of the barrier, then of course the, the big molecules are able to go in. But if you've just got subtle changes, then something like water might be able to pick up that trait, that um, change rather than um, the, the magnetic molecules. Amazing, thank you. Um, I just have one last question, just selfishly for myself, if that's okay. Um, so I know you said that you you moved from from science communication to going into to research and doing your PhD. Um, and obviously you're still kind of keeping up with the science communication aspect um, alongside it. Just wonder what what made you want to move from the science communication to to doing the research and kind of which you which you prefer now, if that's a yeah, <laughs> that's it's. Really I, I like my road my road map or career road map is um it's a little bit there's um I don't know if you can hear that I think someone's just caught I, I don't know what's happening outside so I apologize for, for that but um so when I was working in science communication like for production companies and so on it was quite fun and it was really interesting to like work in a wide breadth of um, scientific topics for the different programs. Um, but that there was kind of, I realized that my skills um, perhaps were more um, directed in terms of like, it's quite wide the kind of skill set that you have to have to um, do research for programs. Um, and I think I like the idea of like working on one task and really forwarding the understanding in this thing that we don't know about yet. And that really drew me into research um, in terms of like academic research compared to um, research for the and development for the programs where it was talking to people who were doing that research. I kind of like wanted to be that person um, who was who who we were calling up. So um, I do, all, I mean, I think it was great to have had both, like to, to do both sides of the coin um, because it's very, I like to try to make the uh, science that I do a bit more um, accessible to people who are not at, like, who aren't in the MRI field that I'm in. I really enjoy trying to break that down as well. So I think having worked in the uh, in these places um, helped me to do that and gave me kind of, uh, a drive to be able to do that a bit more. Amazing, yeah. Um, you can definitely tell that you have such a, a passion and a talent for both sides, um, which I think is is really uh, really quite something special. So thank you so much for, for sharing this today. Um, I think that's it. I can't see any more questions coming in anywhere. So. Um, that's it for our, our q and La Yolanda, thank you so much again for your time this evening. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and I'm sure there are so many young female and minority researchers feeling very inspired and empowered from what you have shared with us, so thank you. Um, make sure to watch this space for how Yolanda's research and inclusivity work progresses. Um, be sure to follow all of her personal accounts, which I'm sure we'll post, um, and also Minorities in STEM, which was an organisation that sounds like it's doing wonderful things. Um, I'm sure very exciting things are on the horizon for you, not just for the world of brain health, but also for diversity and inclusion in STEM. So definitely very excited to see what the future holds. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. I've really enjoyed